is found in Philippians chapter 1 and verses 9 to 11. So let's read this together. It says this, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory <laughs> and praise of God. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. If, if we were to personalize this prayer, we would be praying, Father, I pray that my love would abound more and more and knowledge and depth of insight so that I may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to the praise to the glory and praise of God it's a great prayer isn't it it's a wonderful prayer and the reason why I gave this prayer the title, The Splendor of the King, is because of how this prayer ends. To the glory and praise of God. But what is it that brings glory and praise to God? Well, let's read the prayer in reverse. According to this prayer, it's when we are able to discern what is best or what is excellent. But of course it doesn't stop there because it's not about discerning what is best or excellent in our own eyes. But it's about that best enables us to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And so this prayer asks that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, before we get into the prayer in detail, there's a little bit of context that we need to understand, and that is in relation to the, what is the day of Christ. The phrase day of Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus is a phrase that's actually unique in Paul's letters. He mentions it in 1 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, he mentions it here in Philippians, and he also mentions it in 2 Timothy. And there's another phrase that you may have heard called the Day of the Lord. And this is uh, common throughout the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets refer to it all the time. In the New Testament, Jesus referred to it, and Peter referred to it, and also Paul referred to it. But there's a stark contrast between these two days. The day of Christ is generally seen to be for the body of Christ, for the church, those people who follow Jesus. It's generally viewed as a day of blessing, a day of reward. It's eagerly anticipated because it is our heavenly hope. The day of the Lord, on the other hand, is seen as a time of terror, a time of wrath. The prophet Isaiah said it is a day of visitation. The prophet Ezekiel said it is a day of the wrath of the Lord. And it's seen as a day for those who have rejected Jesus Christ during their lifetime. It is a day of judgment. Now Hebrews 9 verse 27 says people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. The question is. What judgment will we face when we leave this earth? Will it be the judgment of the day of Christ? Or will it be the judgment on the day of the Lord? 
You see, all of us are imperfect. We've all done something. We've all thought something. We've all said something that has gone against God's commands. We've all broken God's instructions. And the Bible calls that sin. And God hates sin because it's against his instructions. And because God is a righteous judge, that sin has to be punished. But while God hates sin, he loves sinners. And he wants those sinners to enter into (coughs) his presence where he dwells. And so he sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus had to live before God, but he also came to do the will of God. And the will of God for him was to pay the price of sin for mankind once and for all. And so on the cross, Jesus (coughs) became our substitute. All of the sin of all mankind over all time was placed on him. That means all your sin, all my sin, past, present, and future was placed on him. The Bible says he became sin. It's a lot of sin. It's an awful lot of sin. And so Jesus suffered and died on the cross because I said earlier, sin had to be punished. He paid the price for sin. Your sin. My sin. But death couldn't hold him. God raised him from the dead demonstrating the power of sin had been broken. Sin was defeated. Sin was overcome. The punishment of sin was complete. It is finished, Jesus said. The punishment for sin was done. It was accomplished. The will of God was accomplished. So when we leave this earth, Our judgment and face judgment, it will be based on how we have responded to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And if we don't believe that Jesus died for us, and we don't accept him to be our saviour, then we are rejecting the life, the price that he paid for our sin. And our sin does not get forgiven. Therefore, when we leave this earth, we will be judged for our sin on that great and terrible day of the Lord. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then can I implore you to come to know Jesus. Come to know Jesus. Come and know God's love for you in sending Jesus to pay the price for your sin. Turn away from your sin and welcome him into your life. Welcome him into your heart and know the joy of having sins forgiven. But if we do believe that Jesus died for us, for our sin, and we have accepted him into our lives to be our saviour, then our sin is forgiven. And we will not... uh, our judgment will not be on that great and terrible day of the Lord because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But we will face judgment on the day of Christ because that judgment, we will not be judged for our sin because Christ has taken it away. When Jesus, when we believe that Jesus has died for us, um, for our sin, for my sin, you see, it has to be personal. When we believe that then, through faith, our sin gets forgiven because Jesus has paid the punishment for us. And the amazing thing is, this amazing grace that we so often sing about means that our sin was his. And because he's our substitute, his righteousness, his perfection, his life becomes ours. Isn't it wonderful? What a saviour we have. But while we might not be judged for our sin, we will be judged for, as Pastor Eric Parker has often said, how have we fought? 
How have we run? What have we thought, said, and done? And on that day, anything that is not to the glory and praise of God will be removed. Because heaven is a place that is all about the glory and the praise of God. So it makes sense that anything that is not to the glory and the praise of God is removed. That seems sensible, doesn't it? Paul says to the Corinthians, No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, referring to the day of Christ, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So what we want to have remaining are things that are to the glory and to the praise of God. So this prayer is in the context of the day of Christ. There's a prayer that we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. It's a prayer for those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I know that many of you have this morning. And so this prayer is for those of us who have made that choice. So what does it mean to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ? Well, in the book of Jude, it says this to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Jesus is able to present us before God the Father without fault. <laughs> because Jesus has taken away our sin. The Bible calls the word justification. Just as if I had never sinned. It's wonderful. And so often we focus on that part to the extent that we forget that Jesus is also able to keep us from stumbling or keep us from falling, as some versions say. And if you hear what Jude is saying, he's actually saying that the keeping from stumbling comes before the presenting before God without fault. And Jesus is going to do that. And if Jesus is going to do that with great joy, then that implies that we have lived lives to the glory and to the praise of God. Doing the will of the Father. Because that's what brings Jesus joy. And if we look at our prayer in Philippians, we ask that we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Now, being filled with the fruit of righteousness is not distinct from being pure and blameless. And while we trust Jesus to present us before God without fault, there is also a reality of responsibility that we have to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And that in itself tells me a number of things. First of all, it tells me that I cannot be filled with the fruit of righteousness unless it comes through Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus that we can bear fruit. It's only through Jesus that we can bear any fruit. What did Jesus say in John 15 verse 5? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me, you can do zippity doo da <laughs> Nothing. The fruit of righteousness only comes through Jesus Christ. It cannot come any other way. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians when he was talking about the day of Christ that the starting point is the foundation that Christ has laid. It's accepting him and what he has done on the cross because he is the vine. We can't bear fruit unless we are abiding or remaining in Jesus. But I want you to look at the emphasis in the prayer. 
It is to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. If we think back to John 15, 5, when we remain in Christ and he in us, is that we bear much fruit. The emphasis is on being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Not half measures. We're not praying that we will bear 50% of the fruit. We are praying that we will bear 100% of the fruit. We can't afford just to coast through and assume that everything will be okay. Yes, we will be saved. But what brings glory and praise to God is a life lived to the glory and to the praise of God. A life filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And that means that we are waging war on our sinful nature to live a life pursuing holiness, a life after the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to be continually be being filled by the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit, the Spirit in your living space, as Pastor Adrian said last week. <coughs> That means we're also looking for a full measure of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We want all of them in abounding measure. It also means that we are looking to accomplish all the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Not 25% of them. Not 50% of them, not even 95% of them, not even getting an A. We want an A plus, 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 because we're looking to fulfill all the good works God has prepared in advance for us to do. Why? Because we are his workmanship. <coughs> we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us, not someone else, us to do. Titus 2 verse 14, Paul says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And what he expects you to do is different to what he expects me to do, but he expects you to do and he expects me to do what he's given us to do with eagerness. With eagerness. With a passion. With a hunger. Without grumbling or arguing. Paul tells the Philippians later on, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure. Oh, oh. There it is again. So that you may be blameless and pure. <coughs> Children of God without fault. In a warped and crooked generation. You see the link here? Once again, to being pure and blameless and the requirement to fulfill not partially meet, but complete his good purpose. And we need to get a hold of this this morning. If we want to be pure and blameless <coughs> on the day of Christ, then when we stand before him to give an account, if we want to be pure and blameless for that day, then we cannot afford just to coast through. And this is something the Holy Spirit really impressed in my spirit as we were praying, as I was preparing this. There needs to be a hunger. There needs to be a passion. There needs to be an eagerness. There needs to be a waking up in the morning with a desire for Jesus. There needs to be a hunger for the things of the Spirit, a passion for the purpose of God in our generation, to ready to do his work through us today. And I just felt the Holy Spirit say there's so many of us that may be just coasting through. 
We're not waking up in the morning without passion, without eagerness, without hunger, without desire to do the fulfill the will of God in our lives this day. We're just coasting through, hoping it will be okay. I just felt the Holy Spirit say, we need this hunger. We need to reattach this eagerness, this passion, so that we can be filled, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We need to get a hold of this. Yes, we can rely on what Christ has done for us on the cross. Absolutely. We also need to get a hold of our responsibility to have that passion, that hunger, that eagerness to be, that seeks to just be filled with the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit resting and abiding in Jesus, eager to do all that he has created us to do. How have we fought? How have we run? What have we thought, said and done? Are we aiming to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ? This is what it means to bring glory and praise to God. Yes, it's people who have been saved and who stand in the righteousness work of God on the cross. And it's those who have sought to be filled, live lives that have sought to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ. And it's fruit that comes through Christ. It's not through us. It's through Christ. Because when it's through Christ, He gets the glory and the praise. So we ask that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best. What we are asking for here is our love to get bigger, to abound more and more. So that means if our love is like one of these baby circles that you see on the curtain round about you, it means that you are seeking to go from a baby circle to a slightly bigger circle, and then to an even bigger circle, and then to the largest circle that you see on the wall, and then beyond that is to ever, ever, ever increase, that our love may become more and more, may abound. And as our love, and our love gets bigger through knowledge and through depth of insight, what we are talking about here, folks, just to be clear, is our love for Jesus. As we increase in knowing Jesus better and understand what that then means, it will result in us loving Jesus more. In 2 Peter it says, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. Love is the goal of all things. He goes on, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive or unfruitful, as some versions say, in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see the link between love increasing and being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from where? Through Jesus. And this ever-increasing love for Jesus helps us discern what is best, helps us discern what is excellent. And as Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm sure you know it, it says love is indispensable. Love is the most excellent way. So if we speak with human eloquence or angelic ecstasy, but don't love, we're nothing but a creaking old rusty gate. If we speak God's word with power, 
revealing all his mysteries and make everything plain as day. And if we have faith to say to a mountain, jump and it jumps, but we don't love, we're nothing. If we speak, if we give everything we own to the poor, and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but we don't love, we've gotten nowhere. So no matter what we say, what we believe, what we do, we're bankrupt without love. Oh, that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may discern what is best or what is excellent, which is the way of love because that's Jesus' way. So in conclusion, to discern what is best or what is excellent has implications for us. It's not just recognizing what is good out of knowledge and understanding. It's action in love. It's abounding in love. It's embracing and delighting in the way of love. And we love because he first loved us. And he has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit so there is no excuse not to love. To not allow love to abound more and more in our lives as we know him better, as we understand what it means to follow his way of love. Loving more means loving people more, but it's, it's bigger than that. It's, it's loving, it loves, it loves God's word, it's, it's delighting in, it's savoring the will of God, the things of God. Excellence has to be discerned, known through love. John Piper says of this, we need truth saturated love and love saturated truth. It's nothing more than asking for a profound transformation of love as Jesus ever increases in our hearts, as we know him better, as we understand what it means to follow him, to fulfill all of what he has asked us to do out of love for him, which is grounded in his love for us. Because our goal is to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. Do we want to live for the splendor of the King? Do we want to live to the glory and to the praise of Jesus? Do we want to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. So that he says to us on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. Because the day of Christ is a day of blessing, a day of reward, is to be eagerly anticipated, is our heavenly hope. And if that's your heart this morning, then let's pray this prayer. Father, I pray that my love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that I may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes <coughs> through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I just want to give an opportunity this morning. If you feel the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and challenging you in your life, maybe about the love that you have for him, 
challenge to allow it to increase, to abound more and more. Or if you feel the challenge of the Holy Spirit to say, too long you have been coasting through, it's time to wake up with an eagerness, with a hunger and a passion for the things of God, for the things of the Spirit, to fulfill completely, 100%, all that he is asking us to do.